Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. It's an interesting story. There's a father that has a vineyard, and it's time for harvest. You understand that the period of harvest is not extended. There's a short time, because when the fruit gets ripe, it needs to be gathered, or it will rot. And so the father has two sons, and he says to his boys, he said, uh, I want you to go, and I want you to work in the harvest. And one of them says, sure, I'll go, and he doesn't. Now, I have to tell you that that's a foreign concept to me, because I, I grew up in the old days where dad's word was law. If you didn't want to go, you went anyway. And if you didn't want to go and you went anyway, you pretended you were happy to go. But in this particular story, there's a son who is told to go and he says, sure, I'll go work, and he doesn't. There's also another son, and dad says to him, he says, "Uh, I I want you to go work, and he says, no. Another foreign concept. But eventually he goes. And the harvest is gathered. Now our Lord gave this story for a specific reason. You draw the parallels. We have a heavenly father. If you have been saved, if you know him, if you've been born again, you are his child. And if you're familiar at all with the Scriptures, you find out that in the Scriptures, the Father says to the children, there are some things I want you to do. And so I want to look this morning at those responses and how that applies to you and me. And so if you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 21, I invite you to stand with me this morning. We'll begin reading in verse number 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verse number 28. Jesus is speaking, and he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them. Verily I say unto you. That the publicans and the harlots. Go into the kingdom of God. Before you. Heavenly Father I pray that you'd. Bless the preaching this morning. I pray it'd be helpful. I pray that each of us would look at our responsibilities. And see if indeed we are obedient children. And we'll thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Be seated, please. It was a personal request. The father said to each of the boys, calling them by their relationship, he said, son. Now, there's a a goofy idea going around, I guess it's been here forever, that, that God is the father of all peoples. Spiritually, that's not the case. He's the creator of all of us, but Not everybody has a relationship. In fact, there was a group of religious people during the time of Jesus, and he said to them, you're of your father, the devil. And so according to the Bible, there are two spiritual families. There are the devil and his children, and God and his children. And the only way that you get into the family of God is you have to be born. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus was thinking of physical birth. He said, how is that possible? But Jesus explained to him that the second birth, born again, is a spiritual birth. It's a transformation that takes place, without going into the whole message on this, let me explain to you that all of us are born with a sinful nature. By that I mean none of us are perfect. And because of that, 
Because of our nature, then we are prone to do wrong, prone to sin. The songwriter said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Well, because of that, we have violated the plan and the will of God. And so the Bible says, not only uh, are, are we all sinners, but it tells us there's a penalty. The wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life. And so uh, the, the scripture explains that Jesus Christ, who had never sinned, Jesus Christ, who is perfect, came to this world and offered himself as a sacrifice for the rest of us. He offered himself as a substitute. The Bible tells us that God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so on the cross, Jesus suffered and bled and died. He was buried and he rose again and paid for our sins. Now all we need to do is accept the gift of God, which is eternal life. The Philippian jailer said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't say get baptized because getting baptized won't get you saved. Paul didn't say, didn't say you need to join Rochester Hills Baptist Church because this church won't get you to heaven. No church gets you to heaven. Paul didn't tell him do the best you can, live a good life, and maybe your good works will someday outweigh your bad works. No, no, no. Paul simply said this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And so there came a time when the jailer realized he was on his way to hell, recognized there was nothing he could do for himself, asked Jesus to save him, and that night the man got saved. When he got saved, he became a son of God. When you got saved, when I got saved, we became the children of God. And so, in this story, when the man says, or when the father says, son, we can apply that relationship to us. If you're saved, you are a child of God. Now, I, know, I want you to understand, family is a, it's a unique relationship. When I was growing up, my very best friend, ironically, his name was Baldy Sutton. We called him Baldy because they just moved to town, and the day after he moved, his dad gave him a buzz haircut, and so everyone called him Baldy. Kids were mean in those days, and it just stuck. Now I feel bad for the guy, but anyway, uh, when, when we were in junior high, uh, uh, Baldy's mom and dad went through a horrible divorce, and so he spent just about every day and every night at our house. He ate at our table. Uh, when we went to visit Grandma, he went to Grandma's. He spent the night. Uh, it, it was as if he was a member of the family, but he wasn't. See, there are lots of people who live a good life and lots of people who act like they're saved and lots of people who talk like they're saved, but, but when you get right down to it, they're not a member of the family. And so there's a, there's a privilege of being a family member. So oftentimes there's a family likeness. How many of you have children and strangers have to tell you they either look like the husband or the wife? I like the story about the ladies uh, standing at the bus stop and she's holding her little baby and another lady looked at her and said, wow, that's the ugliest kid I've ever seen. And of course, the lady's offended. She begins to weep, and a fellow standing there said, Ma'am, is something wrong? She goes, That lady just offended me. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, I tell you what, let me get you a cup of coffee, and maybe I can find a banana for your monkey. <laughs> Sometimes there's a family resemblance. You know, you and I ought to, I don't mean look physically like God, but we're supposed to be conformed to his image. A family has uh, special privileges. A few weeks ago, uh, Miss Marla had a garage sale. It was on the rainiest, coldest, windiest day of our fall. 
And she had a garage sale, and Christy had a bunch of her junk she wanted to get rid of. And so Jeremiah says, Dad, can I borrow your pickup? And I said, well, of course. And so he borrowed my pickup, and he, he uh, took her junk over and probably brought it back home again. That's how garage sales generally work. But my point is, there are lots of fellas in our church that have pickups, but he asked me first, why? I'm his dad. The relationship, there's, there's special privilege. By the way, if you're saved, you have special privileges with Almighty God. He says to this, he says, ask and ye shall receive. He says, call unto me and I will answer thee and will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, although Baldy spent all that time at our house, he couldn't call my dad his dad. Although he spent all that time at our house, he, he was privy to some privileges, but he didn't get what we got because there was a difference. And although God does bless the unsaved, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, a person that knows Christ as Savior has that relationship. And so he says, he says, son, Go work in my vineyard today. I want you to sense there's, a, uh, there's, there's an urgency. It, it has to be done today. We can't procrastinate. We can't wait. We can't put it off. It has to be done. The, the harvest is ready. It's, if, if we tarry, it'll rot. If we wait, it'll be wasted. I need you to go today. And so he asked his boys. He said, go work in my vineyard. I have some things that I want you to do. By the way, as I already mentioned, there are some things in the Bible God has for us to do. And so it's important for us every now and then to just stop and take a little inventory. Uh, You know, number one, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? If we had time and went around the room and I said, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, obviously, number one, we're supposed to get saved. After we're saved, we're supposed to get baptized. If we're saved and baptized, we're supposed to be active members of a Bible-preaching church. You know, I was in Saginaw last week and they never did catch on to this amen thing. My sermons were so long. For those of you visiting with us, the way it works here, the more amens I get, the shorter my sermons. And it's getting real quiet, so let me, let me, let me start this portion over again. Uh, uh, if you're not saved, you're supposed to get saved. You're supposed to get baptized. You're supposed to be a, a member of a Bible-preaching church. Sure you are. You're supposed to read your Bible and pray and tell others about Christ. We, we know what we're supposed to do. We take an inventory. How do we know? Because the Father has told us. And so I examine my life and I say, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Are there things that I'm doing I shouldn't do? Are there things that he has prohibited or he has told me are wrong and they're evident in my life, not just my actions, but my attitudes? Am I bitter? Do I hold a grudge? Am I a gossip? And so we take inventory of our life. The Father had specific instructions. I want you to notice the answers. There are four possible answers when God speaks that we can give to him. We can, number one, say no and then not do it. You need to get saved. No, and I'm not getting saved. You've been saved, but you're not, you need to get baptized. No, I'm not getting baptized. You need to, to, to join the church. No, I'm not going to be a church member. No, I'm not going to read my Bible. No, I'm not going to pray. No, I'm not going to be faithful. No, no, no. What does that demonstrate? Well, obviously, it demonstrates rebellion to the Father. It demonstrates there's a problem in the relationship. Now, we understand that God is the perfect Father. And so if, if my Heavenly Father and I have a problem in our relationship, I think it's fair to assume it's not God's fault. The problem's got to be here. And so a son says, 
No, I'm not going to obey, and doesn't obey. There's another possibility. The son could say, no, and then change his mind. That's what happened in the story. He could say, no, and then do it anyway. What causes that? Well, first of all, he'd have to think about the reasons why he should. Dad says, go work in the vineyard. He said, no, I'm not doing that. And so he goes back to doing whatever he's doing. He begins to think, well, you know, if I don't go, the harvest is going to perish. And number two, he, he is my father, and I have a responsibility to obey him. And And... and Number three, even if I don't want to, if I, if I love him, I should do it. And so there is repentance involved. Repentance is a changing of the mind that always leads to a changing of actions. He didn't want to go and he changed his mind and so he went. And oftentimes with God's people... Well, I know I need to get baptized, but oh, I just hate to get in front of people. And then you realize you're supposed to, and you say, I'll do it. Well, I, I, I know that I'm supposed to be a soul winner. I sure would like to tell people about Christ, but I'm so shy. And then you realize, if I don't tell them, they're going to hell. If I don't tell them, nobody will tell them. If I don't do what I'm supposed to do, maybe they, they will never hear. And so I, I, I change my mind and it changes my heart and it changes my attitude. In every area, whatever sin, maybe it's that habit that you can't get victory over. And you've tried and you've said to God, no. And then God changes your heart and changes your mind. I love that song that we sang this morning. It's probably my favorite of all the hymns. When I survey the wondrous cross. The idea is if, if I would just stop and think about what Christ did. I love that last verse that says, We're the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The third possibility is the son who says no, who says yes, and then he doesn't go. And I really think that's where many of us are a lot of the time. Our intentions are good. Son, go work in my vineyard. Oh, sure, Dad, I'll be glad to. And as he starts to go to work, he remembers he's got to take care of this. He gets distracted by this. Uh, this comes up and that comes up. And before you know it, he didn't do it. It's not a matter of intention. It's a matter of priority. And how many of us have even knelt at the altar and promised to God, Lord, I will read my Bible, I will pray, I will be a soul winner, I will get victory over this sin, I will get right with this person that I've been bitter toward, I will do this, I, I, I'll do better, I'll be a better dad, I'll be a better husband, I'll be a better wife, I'll have a better relationship with my parents, Lord, I, I, I want to do right, and we're sincere, and we mean it, and we're consumed with the idea of, I'm going to fix this problem. And we don't. Or it's like New Year's resolutions. We do for a while. New Year's diets are my favorite because they're the shortest. <laughs> Two, three days is about all they last, which is plenty when you're a physical specimen like me, but way too much laughter on that one. But he says, go. Yes, sir, I will. And he doesn't. Let me ask you something, church. What is it that we promised God we would do and we still haven't done it? 
Well, I sure would like to give to missions. I'm going to give to missions. Well, I need to tithe. I'm going to start tithing. You know, I, I've got to get faithful to church. I'm, I, I'm going to make it a priority Sunday morning, night, and Wednesday night. And we're sincere and we mean it. But then we look at our bills and our checkbook and say, I can't afford to tithe. And if I can't tithe, I sure can't give to missions. And I would go to church, but this time of year, we're just so busy. Have you ever noticed there's a non, there's no such thing as an unbusy time of year? I remember when uh, Jeremiah and Christy first got married. I think it was a, no, it had to be right after they first got, they got married in December and we were home in January and he, he was, uh, on staff at our church in uh, the church that I pastored in Missouri. I, he, he was never there when I was there as, on staff, but Brother Ball hired him to be the youth and the music director. And they got married in December, and it's toward the end of January. We were, they, they lived in our house until they were able to buy a house because we were gone in evangelism all the time. And we're sitting at the table, and, and Christy said to Jeremiah, she said, when is it going to slow down at the church? And, and all three of us just smiled and said, this is the slow time. Yeah, it just, there's just so much. And it's not just at the church. It's in your life and yours and yours and yours. We are busy people. And the only way that God is going to be a priority is if we make him a priority. And so we say, Lord, I'm going to do it. But oftentimes we don't follow through. Yes. I'll go work in the vineyard. And then he doesn't go, what happens in that scenario? Well, number one, the harvest perishes. Number two, the father is disobeyed. Number three, the, rela the relationship is eventually hindered. Can you imagine dad calls you in and says, I thought you were going. Oh, man, I forgot. I meant to, I wanted to. My intentions were good. I don't know how far intentions went over at your house, but not very many at mine. And then there's a fourth scenario. There's the son that says, yes, sir, I'll go. And he goes. There's a son that pleases the father. There's a son that rescues the harvest. There's a son who undoubtedly is going to gain more privileges and more benefits, and more blessings from the Father because He has proved Himself faithful. And so I want you to consider this morning in this vast spectrum of all that God has asked us to do, where do we fit? No, I'm not going to do it and we don't. Or, no, I'm not going to do it and maybe this morning we change our mind and get our hearts right. Or maybe... We're that crowd that says, sure I will, I want to, that's my desire, I want to be a good Christian, I want to please God, I want to do right, and we never get around to it. Or how about if we're the group that says, I want to please God and I'm going to do what I can to please God. Probably the greatest shock to me when I went to Bible college, now those of you that don't know my background, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents never went to church. In fact, I had never been to church until after I got to Bible college. And so I, I, I didn't really know anything about living the Christian life. I just knew people were going to hell, and, and I felt like God had chosen me to tell them how to get saved. And so I, I, I surrendered my life to go to Bible college so that I might learn to preach and be able to tell folks how to get saved. And when I went to Bible college, there, there were about 5,000 people where I went to school. I thought all of them were probably on fire for God, super Christians. I never heard of a Christian school. I didn't know there was such a thing, but a lot of these kids went to Christian schools. 
I thought, wow, wonder what that would be like. Many of them had great youth departments and godly pastors and came from a great church. And I thought, wow, I'm never going to catch up to these guys. You know what the greatest shock was? I went to public high school. As far as I know, I was the only Christian in my high school. When I got to college, some of those Bible college students were more wicked than the kids that went to my public high school. They, they told the same jokes. They had the same rebellious heart. Now, I'm not saying all of them, but enough of them that it really caught me off guard. And I thought, is this real? Is Christianity for real? Here, here I thought that I was coming to a place where everybody wanted to serve God. Boy, was I mistaken. Wouldn't it be great if everybody at Rochester Hills Baptist Church wanted to serve God and did so? Wouldn't it be great if we had the kind of testimony where people said, you know, there are a lot of hypocrites in Christianity, but not that crowd. They, they practice what they preach. They do what they believe. The Lord said to the, these religious folks, and that's to whom he was speaking when he gave them this story, he says, you know, the publicans, those wicked thieves, and the harlots. They said no to God, but then they changed their mind and got right. These folks are better than you that profess to do it all and do nothing. And so this morning, I just want to, and I had to do this when I was preparing the message. I had to look into my heart and say, God, am, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Is there more that I should do? Are there things about which you've convicted me that I'm still hanging on? Are there, are there some areas of my life that I need to get busy? If that's the case this morning, I, I just want to encourage you to say to the Father, I'll do it, and then do it. Let's bow our heads.